Go. Hello again, this is Mr. Muffin from Mr. Muffin's Trains. We're gonna to talk today about putting down track and wiring. That's our plan for today. We talked the other day about the two track systems that come in the ready to run train sets. Lionel offers fast track, it's the lighter colored roadbed you'll remember, and MTH offers real track, which is the darker roadbed. Both track systems have an integrated roadbed to protect the carpet from oil on the trains and to keep carpet fibers out of the train. If you're going to build a layout with either one of those systems, since the red roadbed is already integrated, you just have to lay the track down on the board, get it the way you want it, and then screw it down. Both track systems have openings in the track to accept a screw. What size screw? I don't know. When I do it, I use Atlas track screws. They look like this. I'll talk more about those in a minute. One of the disadvantages of the track systems that comes in the ready to run train sets with the integrated roadbed is because the roadbed is integrated, we've got an air gap underneath the track. And candidly, that works like a drum that when the trains run over it, it amplifies the sound of the wheels and it gets kind of loud. Um, there are people that don't like that for sure. There's all kinds of theories about how you can correct it in terms of trying to put foam under the track or or some kind of spray or I don't know there's a lot of crazy ideas in my experience none of those work it's not it's not a worthwhile strategy and so if that noise from the track is going to bother you then I suggest you need to move up to a different track system than fast track and real track like we talked about the other day, there's basically three track systems that the, us that have large, uh, serious model railroads and O-gauge use. One is made by Atlas. I've got a piece of Atlas track right here. We're going to talk about Atlas in a second. The second is a, a track system made by Gargraves and Ross Custom Switches. They both make products that interconnect uh, between Ross and Gargraves. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. And then the third track system is MTH Scale Track, which is also very nice. has a very thin ribbon for the center rail. I don't have any of it here to show you. If you'd like to learn more about that, then you want to go look at the Black Diamond Railway. Uh, it's a video. It's a layout and a video series um, written by Rich Batista. And in that series, he shows you how to build a layout using MTH's scale track. One of the other things he covers in his video series is how to build a layout using flex track, how to install flex track, how to bend it in order to fit the curves in place. And he's really an expert at that. I use flex track for the HO train layout I built a long time ago before I grew up and went to O. And uh, I'm also not a big fan of using flex track. So if you want to learn more about flex track, you want to check out Rich Batista's Black Diamond Railway. So let's move on and talk about Atlas track next. Uh, Atlas track comes with rail joiners right here on the end that are used to connect the track together. They just slide right on like that. To power the track, Atlas makes a unit called a terminal rail joiner. It looks like this. So it's two wires and a pair in a bag. And one of them is red and has a black rail joiner, which tells us that goes on the center rail. And the other one is silver with a black wire for the ground side. And that tells us we put on the ground side. And the way I install these is I put the black one black wire silver rail on the side the rail that's facing the front of the layout is how I like to remember it I slide it on like that and then I slide on the black one like that and you can see I have both wires basically at the same place I then connect the other track which is since the track I've chose it's got rail joiners already on it. I got to remove them. 
and then I slide the two tracks together at the rail joiner just like that and the tracks are connected with the rail joiners right here we're going to talk more about how frequently we use rail joiners in a few minutes now once you have all the track put together and this would be true for either atlas or gargraves we want to use a road bed and back in the old days your great grandfather used a cork road bed we bought rolls of cork and we would tear them apart in the middle and you know put them together and yuck and I use that in HO. So in today's world, I recommend we use a foam road bed. This foam road bed is made by Woodland Scenics. It comes in a 24 foot roll and we can buy this roll, uh, this road bed. So once we have the track all put together, what we need to do is just shove the road bed underneath the track. Now there are people that tell you you need to glue the road bed down, you don't. The track screws are gonna hold it down. That way, if we want to change the track, we want to take it up and move it and reuse the roadbed, we can. Um, this is our fourth public layout, and it includes roadbed from the first layout we made. We've reused a lot of roadbed. So once you get it under the track with your fingers, and then you can use a track screw, as we talked about from Atlas, put it in there, and then I use an electric screwdriver with a zero bit on it, and then we just put that in there and screw it in. Which I'm not going to do since I'm on a plastic table, but you get the idea. And then as you put in each screw, you basically adjust the road bed, put in another screw, adjust the road bed, put in another screw, and there you go. Let's talk about wiring switches for a minute. Um, I do this differently than anybody else that I know of, but I do it for uh, to ensure, ensure continuity of the power. So when I put together a switch, I put the terminal joiners on all three legs, on the curve out, on the straight, and on the straight on the other side. And then I drill a hole, obviously, and drop them through, and I can connect them together. Because I want to be sure that power passes through this switch without any kind of problem. And uh, so I have always done it that way. I know it's not necessary. I know a lot of people are going to comment on that. But in order to make sure that my switches always work for my trains, I wire all three sides. Let's talk about Gargraves and Ross track next. I brought a couple of straight pieces to show you. Um, their track system has real wood ties. Uh, Gargraves, the, t the track rail sits inside the tie like that, and on Ross track, they're actually hand spiked all the way through. Uh, the reason Gargraves looks like this is because this is a flexible track. You can bend your own curves. At the ends of the track, we're going to install little pins. The track, when you get it out of the box, on one side has three pins, on the other side does not. So we install these pins where we need them. It's a little bit tricky to do with a pair of pliers. You can see I've skinned up my fingers from doing this earlier. I've discovered what works best is if I just set a pin in there and square it up, set the track down, and then use a pair of pliers, the side of a pair of pliers, to push the pin in place. That works really well. Okay, so let's talk about terminal joiners in Gargraves and Ross world, they make a joiner, one of their joiners, with a wire soldered to it, a red one and a black one. Red would be for center, black would be for outside rail. And these we can just slide in here to connect together the track. To be honest, I find them to be a little bit fragile. I broke a lot of them the other day. And on the layout that I just finished using Gargraves, what I did instead was solder to the rails. In order to the solder to the rail, you're going to need to use a Dremel tool with a cutoff disc to clean the black off the center rail. The outside rail is fine. And then what I do is take a piece of wire, my soldering gun, and just put a little solder on the wire, and then hold the wire against the track, and then use the tip of the soldering gun 
to heat it up and solder to the track. It's very easy to do. I did a whole bunch of them just really quickly just the other day. Okay. Now, similar to Atlas, we're going to mount this track system on Woodland Scenics Roadbed. So we've added the rail joiners we need. We connect the track together. We've got it all connected together. Then we slide the roadbed underneath it, just like we did for Atlas. But in Gargraves and Ross, we don't have any pre-drilled holes. So we're going to need to use a Dremel with a little bitty drill bit. And we're going to drill a hole. So we can get the Atlas track screw in there. Using our cordless screwdriver again with the zero bit, we can screw that right down. Now I forgot to mention when we're talking about Atlas, you only want to put the screw in tight enough to hold that tie down. If you screw too hard, go too deep, you'll break this tie. And on Atlas, you'll do the same thing. You'll break the tie off of the track. So what you want to do when you're putting this in is make sure that you get the head of the screw flush on that, uh, on that um, tie. tie. Thank you. Get it flush on that tie and we'll held it down, but not tight enough. We're going to break the tie. And as I already mentioned, these screws holding the track down will hold the roadbed in place. Very simple. Hello again, Mr. Muffin and Mr. Muffin's Trains. I want to talk about wiring concepts. How do we go about wiring a toy train O-gauge model railroad layout? Okay, we're going to start first with a simple layout, maybe a ready-to-run train set or something slightly larger. Um, I'd say up to say eight feet by eight feet in size, something like that. We have basically put our track down in some kind of an oval. And we've attached wires to the transformer, the power supply. And we're running our train. And we may discover that when the train gets on the far side of the layout, it starts to slow down. The reason for that is the track joiners that we have between the pieces of track create some additional resistance. And so the, the current starts to fade as we get farther and farther away from the main connection, the transformer. On a small layout, we can fix that by putting another set of wires over here on the far side and then bring those wires back to the power supply because it's easier for the current to run through this uninter uninterrupted wire than it is to follow the track all the way around. So most customers that have a layout like this and they start to have some issues with power can rectify it really quickly by just putting a single wire on the far side. We talked the other day about control systems for the model trains, O-gauge model trains. And we talked about how you can run the engines conventionally by applying power and bringing the power back down, takes the engine back into neutral, bring it back up, it goes forward, bring it down, bring it up, goes to neutral, so forth. We run the engines conventionally. And we talked about the fact that basically every engine that's manufactured works that way. Now I got a message from a guy the other day that said, no, Lion Chief, the plain old Lion Chief that comes with the remote, doesn't run conventionally. Okay, you're right. Um, but in that box is the remote. So you can apply power to the track, 18 volts, pick up that remote, and operate that train. It, in Lion Chief, every train has got a single remote that matches it. They talk to each other. If you lose that remote or damage it, you can buy a replacement. Lino makes a universal rem remote. We stock those at Mr. Muffin's Trains, and you can use that to run that Lion Chief engine. Now that we've talked about conventional again just for a minute, now we're ready to talk about command control. So why do I want to do command control to run a train? Well, the reason we want to do command control to run a train, there's actually two reasons. 
The first reason is generally we can't access all of the features of the locomotive unless we're in a command control system. So we're sending commands to the locomotive and it's doing what we want it to do. The second reason is in a command control world, we can operate more than one train on the same track at the same time, which is way cool. I and mean, that's the benefit of command control. Because we're talking to each engine individually, we can tell each engine what to do, and we can have multiple engines running on the same track at the same time. Uh, that's just, it's fabulous. I have to have that in my world, that's for sure. Now that we've talked a little bit more about command control, we're going to talk about wiring on a larger layout than the 8x8 we discussed the other day. There's basically two ways to do it. There's a lot of debate about this, but I'm telling you Mr. Muffin's way to do it. And I've used this on several layouts, so I, I back up my techniques here, if you don't mind. So on a layout larger than 8x8, we could go to a wiring system called Common Bus. And what that means is, down here where I have the transformers, and I've got my track again going around the room, I put a terminal block down here. I've got power going to the terminal block. And then I run two pairs of wires. I'm sorry, one pair of wire, two wires. One pair of wire for each loop of track all the way around the layout. And back to the terminal block. So I have a pair of wires, one wire with plus, one wire with ground, that runs all the way around the lamp. And it's important that these two wires run parallel to each other, that they're the same length. And I'll explain that in a minute. They don't have to be like within a millimeter of the same length, but they got to be pretty close to the same length. So when I do this, common bus wiring, I can write that down, common bus wiring. For every loop of track, I'm running a pair of wires all the way around the layout back to this terminal block. Here is a very simple terminal block. You can buy these online, Amazon, a bunch of electrical supply places. And I've got a little bridge in these two ports here and a little bridge in these two ports here. So for that single loop of track we have running, we have out of one side a wire that goes all the way around to the other side and we wire it right here. And then we have a uh, screw down here that goes to the transformer or the power supply. And, the, and that's the plus side let's say and then the ground side, again two screws, I've got one one wire connected here that goes all the way around the layout comes back around to here. All right? Terminal block. Okay, now the track, we've already installed terminal rail joiners for Atlas, or we've soldered a lead for Gargraves, or used Gargraves or Ross connectors. We've dropped that down through the track. And we have the bus, the common bus we've run all the way around the layout. Right here is an example. It's a red wire, so it's the center, it's the positive. And we can buy these things that are called quick connectors. I like to call them suitcase connectors. See what that looks like. And what you can do with this suitcase connector is place it over the wire, the bus, and then take your wire that you dropped down from the track, whoops, I dropped it down onto the floor, and that wire goes in right here. Just like that. And then you can take a pair of pliers and squeeze this metal connector. It'll break through the insulation of both the bus and the wire that goes to the track and connect them. And then there's a little flap that closes over it to seal the connection up, okay? So this is a suitcase connector. For common bus wiring, this works just fine. The problem with suitcase connectors is once you've installed it, you really can't test this. You can't really, if you've got a short 
or something like that, an open circuit, you can't find it easily. Um, and so on a smaller layout, I mean, I still use these, but on a larger layout, what I prefer to do is where the bus, the track wire drops down, is to put in another terminal block. Connect the track wire, positive and ground from the first loop of track, and then below, connect a lead that, that goes to the bus. By doing this, if I need to try to find a short or test it, I can disconnect the wire from the terminal block and then use a, a, a meter and verify that I've got a connection. I've got, the, I've got power where I need it. So on my layouts now, every, I drop track power and then I connect it to a terminal block and then the terminal block has leads that go to the bus. And going to the bus, I can just use the suitcase connector. Let's talk a little bit about how the command control systems work and how that relates to the wiring. TMCC and Legacy work by sending out a signal over the ground side of the track, the negative side of the track. And so when you put in a Legacy base or a TMCC base, you run one wire over to the ground side of the track. If you've got multiple loops of track, you're going to have to connect each of those grounds together. You're going to add a wire to take the ground of loop one to the ground of loop two, the ground of loop three, the ground of loop four, back to the transformer. Legacy and TMCC are basically one-way communication to the engine. So it sends the signal out over this ground connection we just talked about to the engine and then the engine responds. The engine does not send a signal back to the legacy device, right? So all the information you know about the engine and a legacy system, you need to key it in, hand key it in, or use one of the little modules, right? So it's kind of one-way communication via the ground. MTH's DCS system has a little bit more sophisticated communication between the DCS controller or your iPad or whatever and the engine. We send out a signal to the engine via the positive connection on the track. The engine receives the signal and then the engine replies like in a startup command. It sends back a signal down the minus track, right? So it's two-way communication between the DCS system and the engine. When DCS first rolled out, I think it was in 2002, we were a very early installer of that. Some people put it on their existing layouts, which generally had this common bus wiring, and had some difficulty with it. And the difficulty occurred because these paths, the positive path and the negative path, weren't the same length. It was not uncommon for somebody to wire a layout by putting multiple positives out to different blocks and only having a single connection to the ground side. That created a communication problem. The lengths that the signal traveled out and back were different and therefore the packets got out of sequence and the DCS system started to respond with engine not found and various errors, right? I wired my large home layout using the common bus technique and DCS worked fine for me on common bus even though I had a 26 by 35 foot layout. The reason it worked for me was because the plus and the minus wires ran together all the way around the layout and every time I dropped power, I also dropped a ground in the same location. Therefore, when I sent a signal out, it could come back the same path, the same length, and my packets didn't get scrambled. Okay, let's move on and talk about DCS some more. I had to take a break while Mrs. Muffin combed my hair back. She should clean my glasses too. She's kind of fuzzy, but... We'll get there. Okay, let's talk about DCS. So DCS, the MTH folks, 
the wizards do not recommend using common bus wiring because we can have difficulties. And as I've already mentioned, it worked fine for me in that 26 by 35 layout I had in my home. Once I moved to a public location, 1,700 square feet in Carmel, and we built our first public layout, which was quite a bit larger, I used common bus wiring again, and all hell broke loose. I couldn't get anything to work. And I was on the phone, talking to my, my pals, trying to figure out what the deal was. What re MTH recommends you use is a star wiring technique. In a star wiring technique, we have our transformer, our power supply, run into a TIU for MTH's DCS, right? And then we have two wires, a plus and a minus, running out to a terminal block. That's a minus sideways, but you get it. And the MTH terminal blocks I use look like this. So I'd have one of these terminal blocks for every loop of track. The red and the black go to positive and minus coming out of the TIU, that's right here. And then for every location of the track, let's draw a loop in here again, I run from this terminal block a pair of wires to that point where I'm going to drop down and connect. So every connection has a pair of wires drop down and connected directly to this terminal block. So it kind of looks like a star. It's a point to point kind of configuration, right? And by doing this, I'm guaranteeing that the signal that goes out comes back on the same path, or that's the goal, right? I want those links to be the same. So we use this kind of a, a terminal block to wire um, the layout in DCS. We should talk about how we put the track in, in terms of blocks. How do we create blocks? How do we create insulated blocks of track, right? And so in both Atlas and Gargraves, we can use an insulated rail joiner. It's a plastic joiner to just insulate the center rail. And we're going to divide the loop into blocks. So, this means I've got an isolated power section on the plus side. We have one block here and a pair of wires for it. We have another block here and a pair of wires for it. We have another block here and a pair of wires for it. We don't need to insulate the outside rail. We only need to insulate the center rail, okay? Now one of the advantages of this, I'll talk about it in terms of DCS in a minute, but the idea of dividing the layout into blocks helps us if we have a problem, if we've got a short somewhere on the layout, we can disconnect kind of a block at a time and figure out in what block the short exists. That could be a part that fell off of an engine. I've had a kid lay a screw on my track, which obviously creates a short, and uh, having it in blocks helps us figure that out. So how wide can the blocks be, right? Well, believe it or not, it's possible to get the blocks too small where we've got just too many divisions. The blocks, the size of the block is affected by the number of connections. Remember we talked about every time we add a connection, a rail joiner, we create additional resistance which slows the power down. So, and there's lots of rules of thumb about every 12 connections, 16 connections or whatever. I do it basically about every 10 feet. So about every 10 feet, I drop another pair of wires. Uh, we could probably go, I've done 12 feet, I've done 16 feet, particularly when I've got long pieces of track, flex track, or 40 inch straights. So how often do you do it? I mean, I, I think I've done uh, back on the layout behind me, 60 feet long, 40 feet wide. I mean, that, that entire dog bone loop has probably got 12 drops. So it doesn't have to be as frequently as people think but uh, 10 feet, 12 feet, 16 feet, something like that. So let's look at a simple DCS installation I've done here in the extension. We added a 100 foot long extension on the layout just recently and I've got this little control area set up 
and I can kind of show you what that looks like over here. So the power supply I'm using over here are Lionel 180 watt bricks. And I've got a fella that makes a connector. They got those funny Lionel connectors on one end. I have a gentleman that makes me a connector that plugs into the Lionel and then converts it to banana plugs, red and black. And I sell those if you need one. Uh, he makes those for me. So over here, I'm getting power from Lionel 180 bricks. This could be a Lionel ZW or could be a Z4000, MTHs. Z4000, that's my favorite transformer. I've got several of them on the other part of the layout. So that could be a power source. The one thing we don't want to do is use a Lionel CW80. The Lionel CW80 transformer has a chopped sine wave in its signal that it sends out, which who would care? DCS cares because DCS needs that full sine wave in order to, in order to carry its signal. So the chopped sine wave means the DCS signal won't carry on that power without issues. So if you've got a CW80, you can't use it for DCS. Use it for something else. Lights. Mail it to Mr. Muffin. I can use it for something. All right. So then look over here again. So now I've got a TIU, a track interface unit from MTH sitting here. I've got three tracks powered up. There's a variable here I've converted to fixed, fixed one and fixed two. Don't forget that DCS gets all its power from fixed one. So fixed one has to be powered up in order for the TIU to operate. Now you can put an external power supply, you can buy one from Radio Shack if they still exist, plug that in out here and it'll power the TIU separately. On the big layout, we've done that on all the TIUs. But on this little layout, we're just using the power from fixed one to power the TIU. I've also got a Wi-Fi unit here. This is a DCS WIU, which lets me connect to this um, little layout using my iPad or my iPhone. That's what we see here plugged into the end. And then I've also got a regular DCS remote that are still made. If you want one of these uh, and you don't have one or you want a backup, you want to get it ordered pretty soon. The last manufacturing run of these by MTH is happening now. We'll get those at the end of January, and then that'll be the end of them. You won't be able to get one. So if you want one, you want to get it. I have this unit tethered to the TIU. When you tether a remote to the TIU, this remote will only talk to that TIU, and that TIU will only talk to this remote. It overrides everything else. I have that done this way on this little layout because I don't want signals from the big layout to interfere with this TIU or this handheld. I don't want this handheld to see engines that are running on the big remote. I'm sorry, big layout. Okay, so now here are the terminal blocks we talked about a minute ago. So on the left-hand side is the outside track we have on this little layout. This next one is the second track, the inside track, main line on this layout. And then the one on the right here, with a wire disconnected, I don't remember why, I better figure that out, is for the yard area on this layout. This layout's got a large passenger yard that I can park a lot of passenger trains in, and I wanted to power it separately. So that's what's going on there. So you can see in the terminals in the terminal block, there's a pair of wires, a red and a black, and each one runs to a terminal rail joiner on the layout. So again, what we've done is we put a terminal rail joiner, in this case with Gargave's track, I actually soldered terminal leads, drilled a hole and dropped them through the board to a small terminal block, and then that terminal block has two wires that are connected to this terminal block, and that terminal block is connected to the output of the TIU. And the input side of the TIU is connected to one of these 180 watt Lionel bricks. So this would be a common way to wire a layout. Now I haven't added TMCC over here yet. I need to go down to the store and steal um, a Lionel uh, base unit. Uh, Jeff's got one on the shelf and bring it down here 
and I'll set it here and I'll run one wire from it to the ground side of these blocks. I've got them all tied together. So I'll run one wire to the ground side of this block and that'll transmit the uh, TMCC or legacy signal across all three blocks across this entire layout. That wraps up what I wanted to talk about in this session. Next, I'm going to work on some suggestions on track planning. Maybe I should have done that first. Oh, well. Uh, if you have any questions about what we've covered, you're welcome to call us. Our phone number at the store is 765-292-2022. That's 22 for choo-choo, easy to remember. My son's down there during the day, Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 5, Saturday, 10 to 3. He's bigger than me. We call him Mini Muffin. Um, or you can email me, which always works, Mr. Muffin at Mr. Muffin's Trains. First S is possessive, second S is plural. I have more than one train. Dot com. Mr. Muffin at Mr. Muffin's Trains.com, and we'll be happy to help. Thanks for watching.